name is Heather Wooden, and I'm the IEST Meetings and Education Program Coordinator. Um, so I do have a few housekeeping items before we begin. So obviously we'll be doing um, this webinar as a Q&A. If you have any questions, there's no need to type it into the chat box. Feel free to just unmute yourself. Um, if you don't want to interrupt something that's going on, there is a raise hand option. The raise hand option is going to be at the bottom of your screen. There's a little smiley face. If you click that, there's going to be a raise hand option as well, too. And then I can call on you or Julie can call on you if she sees it. Hold on one second. So, um, if you aren't familiar with who IEST is, I know we do have some non members on here today. Um, we are a membership association that gives technical guidance to professionals working in controlled environments. It's the only organization that exclusively serves professionals work responsible for the design, test, evaluation, and reliability of products and systems. And we are also the administrator. Um, through our working group 43 that helps to um, develop and update MIL standard 810. So I am going to introduce our moderator for today. I would like everyone to first introduce themselves um, who is on the call today. So just let us know your name and your company. Um, we'll just do something simple. At, to stay on track with time. So um, I have two Aaron's on. So Aaron, um, not Lehman, Aaron, the other Aaron. You can unmute and let us know information. Go ahead. Yes, my name is Aaron Mebbin. I'm an engineer at Iris Technologies in Alabama. All right, next we have Aaron Lehman. I'm Aaron Lehman. I'm with System of Systems, uh, Build Environmental Test Chambers. All right. Thank you. Next, I have Austin. Hello. Uh, I'm also with Iris Technologies. All right. Thank you. Next, I have um, Doug. There. Uh, yes. Douglas Burnett, Sigma Design in All right. Thank you. Hey, um, Douglas, you're coming in a little bit faint. So quiet. next next time, make sure you use your outside voice. Gotcha. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> uh, next we have, uh, is it Harsha? I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that. That's right. Uh, Harsha Koparu with uh, Dyrus Technologies. Thank you. Uh, next we have Hunter. Hunter Phillips with Iris Technologies. Um, Jim Whalen, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? This is Jim Weiland. I'm a member of the IEST staff in the membership area. I'm sitting in and uh, you may hear from me after uh, after the program as well. So thanks to everyone for attending. I hope, uh, hope you have a good one here. Uh, next we have, is it Mayor? It's more, but uh, it's okay. And more Barzilai, uh, engineer at the uh, LB system. All right, thank you. Uh, next we have Philip. Good afternoon. Um, Philip Jackson, I'm an engineer at Iris Technologies. Thank you. And then Quinn. You can go ahead and unmute. There you go. Sorry. Um, I'm Andy Quinn from Moog Space and Defense. All right. Thank you. And then I know we had one other. I can't remember your name. Sorry. Hi. My name is Ross right Jameson. I'm with Iris Technologies also. All right. Thank you. So now I'd like to introduce to you our moderator. Who's going to handle this session? So, uh, Julie Jennings. I'm sorry, I lost it. Hold on, Julie. I know who you are. Um, and Julie Jennings, she has over 20 years of experience as an environmental engineer for Lockheed Martin. 
She is currently the Qualification Test Manager for the Targets and Countermeasures Program in Huntsville, Alabama, working with the Missile Defense Agency. So, Julie, you can go ahead and take it away and introduce our panelists for today as well. Sure thing. So, a um, couple things about me. I work for Lockheed Martin. I've been here forever and a day, seems like. But one of the things that's really cool, uh, in case you haven't know known, if you follow me on LinkedIn, I was recently promoted to Lockheed Martin Fellow in environmental testing. So that's really, really, really awesome. Cool. It just means I have my workload is much, much higher now, but I get to do fun, cool projects. Um, so that'll be great. Um, and we'll see what happens there. Thanks everybody for coming today. I see we got a, a strong contingent out of the IRIS team. I have met almost all of you. Uh, in one shape, way, shape, form, or another. So it's great to have you on board, and hopefully this will give you some, some ex some guidance into the Mill Standard 810. Uh, we are gonna, you know, go through. It's it's really a roundtable discussion with whatever uh, questions that you all have. But let me introduce the panel to you uh, first. I'm gonna start with because he's at the top. Um, Ken, you want to go first? Ken Thompson, introduce yourself. What do you do? What kind of experience you have in 810? Okay, I'm uh, Ken Thompson, U.S. Army ATEC. Uh, been involved with testing my whole career, uh, from vibration to climatics to test directing, and now to running the standardization team for ATEC. I um, have been the custodian of Mill Standard 810, responsible for all changes uh, with the publishing of 810G. Uh, prior to that, it was a responsibility the Air Force had. And now it's actually a responsibility of uh, U.S. Army ATEC. Over. Excellent. Ken's been doing this a long time too. All right, uh, Mike Hale, go ahead. Yeah, good morning. I'm Mike Hale. I'm working at the uh, Dynamic Test Division for Redstone Test Center. I was uh, employed here, civil service, from 1983 to about uh, five or six years ago. I retired. I Still currently support the group here through Tritium Corporation. Um, I've had the, the fortunate uh, career of being able to work within the lab for what, 38 years now. So I guess of which the last 18 to 20 have been in uh, part time support of, uh, of the mill standard. Excellent. And then finally, let's go to Steve. Hi, my name is Steve Brenner. I'm the hard to keep a bio short when you're as old as I am because I started off. <laughs> that uh, used to be called Grumman Aircraft Engineering Corporation when I first started working for them. And the first program I worked on was the lunar module for the Apollo program. Shows you how far back I go. We're testing things to mill standard 810C. And um, since then, um, I've been a lot of different places. I was with the Air Force. I was with Lockheed Missiles and Space Company in Sunnyvale. Uh, spent the bulk of my employed career with a company called Kaiser Electronics in San Jose, which built aircraft display systems. And uh, for the past 10 or 15 years, I've been uh, running Equipment Reliability Institute, where I teach classes in vibration and shock and mill standard 810 testing. Excellent. So it looks like we've got a long list of folks who've got lots of experience with mill standard 810. And I appreciate that. Okay, um, so Heather, did you say that you had at least one question out there? Yes. All right, so what, before we get started, you know, like I said, this is a roundtable discussion, and as Heather mentioned as well, that uh, your participation makes this this work a little bit as well. Um, you know, I've got lots of experience with uh, Mill Standard 810 as well, but uh, you know, kind of uh, my opinion of Mill Standard 810 is is a great guideline on how we do testing. But one of the things that we don't ever want to do is make sure that uh, we use Mill Standard 810 as a cookbook. Because, and I think the rest of the panel will agree with that. It's never a one size fits all. And if we try to do cookbook approach to Mill Standard 810, that's when we get into deep yogurt, and uh, things don't actually turn out the way. You, so we have to, um, but to be able to employ in, 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 employ our gray matter a little bit and use that for so that we can make sure does what we're doing makes sense in the spirit of the standard. All right, so Ken, I already see you have your hand raised. Are you are we just checking it out or you have a question? No, I had a question. What okay, um, go ahead. just so we can sort of uh, have this all in context, what does Iris do? Seems like we have a lot of people from there. Oh, that's a really great question. Um, I don't know. 
Who from Iris wants to take that? <laughs> They're all shy. <laughs> I can try to take that. So um, uh, Iris does uh, primarily RF systems and uh, radar analysis as our background. Um, lately, we've been moving more into deliverable hardware products for DoD primes. So right now, we're working on a couple of programs where military qualification is at the forefront for um, new technologies. But we also do a lot of uh, software, algorithm design, stuff like that. So there's a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. Yep. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Arsha. Appreciate that. Um, OK, go ahead. Our first question that I got ahead of time was from Aaron Neiman. So Aaron, I don't know if you want to go ahead and just unmute yourself and ask the question. I do have those documents you sent me that I can share when you let me know. OK, yeah, this is very specific questions uh, towards the method 506.6. Uh, I have a current project where I'm um, building somewhat of a multi-chamber that does uh, the rain, blowing rain tests, uh, icing and freezing rain tests, and then a portion of the freeze thaw test. So um, I had my customer come to me and they, you know, I'm pretty familiar with the method. It's pretty straightforward, but there were some things that they asked and I was just hoping to get a little bit of clarification on because they did specify and want uh, to use uh, in that method, there's a couple figures or drawings of different types of rain dispensing units. Um, one for the rain and blowing rain or a recommended practice, uh, I guess I should say. Uh, and the other one is for procedure three, the drip test. Um, so I guess, uh, and they've specifically said, you know, we want you to design this per, you know, what the mill standard shows. So uh, with that in mind, um, I guess I, I, I'll start out with, uh, I guess, the first question, just being, uh, has anybody there, you know, or designed to work with RAIN uh, test systems for this uh, standard or, you know, for this method? And I uh, wanted to see if there was any new technology being used for raindrop size or and the velocity uh, requirements. Um, you know, are they, is that stuff that's being recorded uh, in real time or is it, you know, just simple capturing the raindrops, measuring it over time to kind of get that information? So maybe we'll just start with that one first question. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Um, I have not done a whole lot of rain tests in my career, but because uh, we try to analyze those away and not do them. Uh, so Steve or and um, probably Mike's not probably a, one to do to know those, but maybe Steve or Ken, I think you guys could probably tackle this. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. I just want to say one thing is, is hello, Ken. I haven't seen you in probably 10 or 12 years. It's nice to see you still around and still working on mill standard 810. No problem. Um, Rain test. Um, we actually have the drip test is, in, and Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, the drip test is in the rain test, but it doesn't have anything to do with rain, but it had to go somewhere and it was closer to rain than anything else. But um, the rain, the drip test itself, actually, uh, there's two thoughts to that test. It's one condensation or two, a small hole in a tent or a shelter or something. Right. Um, you actually look at the apparatus that's recommended in there. You could almost say we're our own worst enemy in the sense that um, when attempting to do a larger item, you come up with a larger fixture rather than just a single point drip, which is what it's supposed to um, simulate. Uh, with all that said, though, um, when you go to a larger um, apparatus to deliver that, you might as well do a, some, uh, an immersion test. I mean, because it's an incredible flow of rain. And the other complications associated with building that apparatus is the fact that you've got to have it sort of encapsulated so that any kind of pressure doesn't affect that drip rate. Um, so it, it is what it is there. Um, of course, we always try to accelerate testing. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I tend to uh, push people towards immersion if they're really concerned about that. Same applies to the uh, car wash test in there, the water tightness. Um, 
it's good for seals and things if you have the ability to have a large item uh, temperature condition prior to the event. Um, but they're also really there's 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 a considerable amount of this that can be done by analysis or either um, on a smaller scale than an all up system. For the standard rain test itself, uh, that's been used forever. I mean, the only thing that's ever really truly tailored in there are the rates and potentially the uh, if you're going to throw a uh, wind in there. Now, in the sense of the droplet size, um, we work closely with some vendors uh, to ensure that the nozzles we're using are, are generating the proper droplet size. Um, you, there's multiple ways to verify it. Um, but a lot of times providing you have a given nozzle and it's got a spec sheet and a calibration sheet, you can rely upon that and then a, a collection rate to accompany it. Over. Aaron, does yeah. that help you? Oh, go ahead, Steve. The only thing I wanna to add uh, to what Ken said is that most of the time out in the labs when we're running the rain test, um, whether it be a, a, an in-house lab or a third-party test lab, we're usually just using nozzles that are certified by the manufacturer to give us our, this, a specified raindrop diameter as long as you're running the water at the specified pressure. So therefore, you wanna use a calibrated uh, pressure meter uh, regulator to make sure when you're running the test that you're actually running the right pressure and you don't really have to worry about the droplet size because you hopefully you have a certified nozzle from the manufacturer that says your droplet size is correct. If you actually want to go and measure the droplet size yourself, then that becomes really tricky. But typically, I've never seen it done. I've run lots of rain tests. We've used the proper nozzles from the correct manufacturers. We have a certification sheet from them that says you run at this pressure, you got the right size raindrops. And then the only tailoring that we do, uh, just as Ken said, is could be the rainfall rate and the the, the wind velocity. Uh, good good uh, comment yeah, on that. I I wasn't sure on the the I did not realize that about the droplet size. Uh, somebody had a follow on discussion comment. Don't want to interrupt. Uh, oh, I was uh, yeah, I was just going to say that uh, there's some new technology out. Uh, it's like a laser optical dis distrometer, um, and, and there's been some white papers that have been written on it, but it provides all that information in real time. I haven't used one, but it seems like it would be used in you know for this type of test. Um, but I guess the only thing is, you know, how do you then provide a calibration certificate for that for the customer? But it sounds like really in, in the world of where if you're just relying on the manufacturer to say, yes, this nozzle puts out this and kind of sign off on it, uh, maybe it would be acceptable, or I guess it's probably up to the customer if it would be as far as uh, like a, for a calibration. Of yeah, that typically of it's, been, it's been acceptable to have the cow sheets from the, the manufacturer. Um, okay. Depending on which one you use, I do know some of them out there go through the same process you're talking about to yep. characterize that nozzle. Um, I've, I've witnessed some of the different instrumentation they have for trying to characterize them, and it, it's it's uh, it's sufficient. There, it, it, there's an analogy, oddly enough, to the sunshine testing. In that when we do mill standard 810 sunshine testing, we have a specified spectrum, how much energy is at each wavelength. To actually measure that, you'd have to use a spectral radiometer, which is a really expensive instrument. However, typically what we do is we have lamps that are certified by the manufacturer that they are giving us our official U.S. government mill standard 810 sunlight if we're running at the specified voltage. You can't change the voltage, just like you can't change the pressure on the water for the raindrop thing. It's a very similar analogy. You run at the right voltage, you're gonna get that. And again, just like the rain test, I've never had any sort of contracting authority not accept that. Okay, yeah. Now, just, just for clarity's sake, uh, on the solar piece, we do uh, anywhere from a semi-annual to an annual um, inspection in Cal on our chambers. So that it's, uh, we ensure we're still within, or there may be some spottiness where you need to swap out some bulbs or something. But yeah, we do go through a semi-annual and annual maintenance on those. Whereas on the rain, you know, we, we're pretty good to go with it until you see a, I hate to put it this way, but until you see a nozzle sputtering, <laughs> you know what I mean? And then you'll- Like in okay. your shower, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Okay, we got a problem with this one, you know what I mean? 
I so mean, like, I mean you're, you're going through and doing collection rates and things like that, but but uh, the moment you even throw wind into the mix, um, it makes it even more difficult to maintain a specific droplet size. I mean, I was just gonna think about. I was thinking about that as we were chatting, uh, Ken and the rest of the crew. Is like, you know, the the droplets are what they are in nature, right? But then when you throw a forty mile an hour wind on top of that, those droplets break themselves up because of the nature of the wind, right? So, yeah, so that yeah. is kind and of thrown out. And... What we'll do is calibrate before we throw the wind on, so we know how we have the rate correct, and then we accept what happens when we apply the wind. You know. Yeah. Agreed. I think that's the, the, the right way to go. Um, one of the things that uh, is curious to me when we talk about rain testing is, you know, when we have other applications, you know, you've got, let's say you've got a speeding missile or launch vehicle or something going through, flying through a rain, a rain environment. Yeah, that's a lot different than what we're talking about in ATEM. Yeah, so. A, a sled test in which you, um, I think it was Holloman, right? Am I right? Holloman has the sled yeah, test. Yeah, Holloman Air Force Base. Yeah, they have that Check. real long, uh, that real long sled test out there. Yeah, that would be the the place that we would typically go to validate that, right? Uh, yeah. To, to yeah, demonstrate it's not that's that. not your standard eight ten type of type. Right. Of so so that kind of goes back to my original thought that even though the mill standard is for rain, there's not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, there's it's not always one size fits all. Depends on what you're trying to emulate. No, and I'd like to encourage anybody really uh, that, that's that's a, a product developer, let's put it that way, to use the questionnaire that's in the front of uh, part one in the LSEP task. That'll at least get you um, some data points collected across all environments. And in addition to that, it'll get enough information together that you can ask intelligent questions. It's not the end all solution, but it can help you to ask those intelligent questions. So I think that's that's exactly right. Any any test that we do, regardless of whatever it is, should always start with what does our LSEP, our life cycle environmental profile, say that our environments should be. Great. Oh, welcome, Vesta. I see the top of your head. <laughs> hey, uh, building on what you said about the rain and the high velocity. Uh, recently, we have a query from a client uh, about hail, which Matt really uh, mentioned in detail uh, or into great detail uh, in H10. And furthermore, he wanted it in insisted, on, insisted on doing it uh, for ships, not aircraft or something like that. Um, and we really we didn't know exactly how to tackle this one. So oh, that, that's have, a great uh, question. That's well, a great question. On, on before we go to the hail question, I want to make sure we close out with Aaron. Aaron, did we did we get you where you want to be with uh, uh, some? I had one more quick question uh, regarding rain, and then I, I, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Then then we'll move on to the hail question because Maor has a really really great um, a really great question with regard to hail. Okay, um, so uh, in procedure one, it's uh, rain and or or blowing rain. Um, so the first question with that is, is that considered the same test? Is it really just a blowing rain test, or is there some instances where do they say rain and blowing rain because uh, you know they could use maybe or just do a rain test without blowing? Um, and there's a requirement for that droplet to reach terminal velocity, uh, which kind of makes that dispenser, you have to raise it up pretty high uh, based on the droplet size or a standard droplet size. But, you know, it has to be up there quite a ways um, to meet terminal velocity. Um, so the, I guess my question is, typically how I've seen this test done is the dispenser is sitting in front of the test item and it falls kind of in front of it, and then the wind blows the rain into the test item. So I guess my question is, what's the purpose of meeting terminal velocity falling vertically if it's going to, you know, be pushed horizontally into the test item? Is there it's a, a it's, great? It's great more question. a function of when it's a standard rain test versus blowing rain. 
Okay. Because, so, you know, so, you got to accept the fact that in blowing rain, that's, that's, you're going to not necessarily hold a, that given droplet size. I mean, what I can say is that it depends on the item in the sense of whether we do blowing rain or just standard rain. Um, okay. So it is two, two tests. So you can do just a, a rain test or you can use the fan also. And, and well, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll use a, uh, let's use a shelter as an example. Because they're they forever are going through rain testing. You may go through a just a standard rain test to verify whether or not the thing leaks. Then again, you may take another look at it as a separate test with the wind to see if all the tie downs and 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 everything are are sufficient. You know, given the wind, or does okay. the wind um, uh, find crevices in it that it, you know can come in? Um, so it's two twofold. I guess is the easiest way to put it. Okay, great. Steve, did you Thank have any, you. any follow up on that? Nope, that's all, all right. about specifying and Ken, Ken is the guy. Yeah, he sure he for sure is. Okay, um, so Mauer, you wanna ask your question uh, one more time for us so that we can uh, discuss the hail? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, in all the standards, basically it's a fan that I, uh, so, uh, hail is usually uh, regarded uh, as a test for uh, air, for like uh, aircraft, um, but in a ship which moves a lot slower in marine environment, um, I couldn't really uh, find the, let's say conditions or logical conditions uh, in order to uh, please my clients. <laughs> Uh, about this uh, test that he insisted on, insisted on doing. Um, you have any ideas? <laughs> hail can be very damaging. Okay. Uh, is the biggest thing to think about with hail. Uh, the, I guess the biggest industry on hail is probably in your shingle industry and in your housing. Um, they've standardized a lot there what they're doing, just in the sense of, you know, does it is it damaging to roofs? To the roof um we have a top which is a test operation procedure for conducting hail testing now there's a couple ways you can do it out from the equipment that's available i mean there's compressed air you can use there's more of a slingshot kind of a method that they're, they're, that's out there also uh, you could look into the astm because that's really what we lean on for hail uh, the only thing i would say is then really to determine if it's required is ask will this item potentially see it in its life cycle? Um, if so, then is there something on this item that uh, that could, uh, that it would find a weak point on it? You know, is it as a radar dome or something? Does it change it, you know, change some aspect of it? But, but other than that, we don't uh, try to have a procedure for hail in, in the stand, in 810 that is. Over. So Ken, are there other standards out there? that uh you know you mentioned some mentioned some the astm standard or a top that, yes uh, maybe we could drop those to, if you know them if you could maybe drop those in the chat window and uh that might help mayor with his uh how to approach those those tests okay that would be great and then i think to answer the other side of the question is you know what is the impact velocity uh it's you know with a ship you said it's you know it's the hail coming down is all of, is really a function of two things, right? Gravity, that works every time, and then any kind of wind that's applied, right? And then, and so you've got any kind of motion of the ship. I think that would be kind of a, a de facto that that's just kind of going to be what it is. But then if you think about things like aircraft or missiles or something like that, very different kind of phenomenon where if it were to to impact one of those hailstones as you're going, you know, at top speed, that's a different kind of philosophy, which I think th those are all the tailorings that we have to take into account. What makes the most sense and uh, to do? And I, I think my word, that's you're probably what you're you're struggling with is I've got a hailstone size and density, and then but what's my what's my what's the right impact speed to use on something like that? We basically, uh, what we did eventually, 
uh, we, like you said, we uh, we assumed uh, the conditions, the size, and the density of the hail we were supposed to to get uh, at the location of the custom of the plant, and uh, we assumed that it will fall in terminal velocity because compared to terminal velocity, the term the speed of the ship won't be that. Uh, I say won't be that critical, and we designed the test according to that. The analysis actually, because uh, we told him that it's like we believe it's too slow and it won't be damaging to the bottom of the radar. Um, but it was like a good plan. I hope you could uh, give me, uh, I don't know, more elaborate things to to hang on. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other specific questions that we have out there? Because, you know, I'm sure that we could all go on forever and ever. Oh, Douglas, go ahead. I see your hand. Yeah, I actually had uh, two that are somewhat broad. Uh, is my volume all right now? You sound great. Thanks. Perfect. Um, the first question is if anybody's done any kind of extensive um, test under the acoustics methods, I'd be really curious to hear anything kind of related to that. Um, I've had a few asks here and there, and it's something that's way outside of our scope or capabilities, and it's just interested in hearing more, particularly how it differs from like the NASA acoustic standards. Uh, and the second was um, I I don't use MIL standard 810 to establish like a statistical reliability of a product's uh, life. Uh, it's not really the intent of the standard if I am understanding it right, but um, has anybody dealt with moving from 810, like from a product uh, item test results perspective, moving from 810 into declaring some kind of, with some kind of statistical certainty, you know, this, this thing will survive X number of miles um, in a transportation vibration test, that kind of thing. Um, oh, two, two really good questions. Yeah, for sure. Sorry to pile it all on, but that. No, 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 that's curious. fine. If, if, if I forget the second question, we'll definitely come back to it. Okay. <laughs> all right. So Mike Hale, you've, uh, any thoughts on the acoustics side of the house? Yeah, on the on the acoustic side, there's you know pretty much at least with eight ten three options. There's just you know your general reverberant chambers. Uh, I think some of the default there's a default spectral shape in the mill standard. It's uh, you know you're always going to see a bit of a haystack shape when you're using horns with acoustics. Um, the various levels uh, that you can see, I think the highest is like 165 dB. You'll see much lower levels than that on a helicopter environment, for example. Um, secondarily, uh, you see some requirements for using wave tubes. Uh, wave tubes, maybe you can get a little bit higher energy into a structure, and sometimes the wave tubes are run in combination with uh, anechoic chambers where you might want to just see how acoustics are affecting a circuit board or something of that nature. More recently, you see the, uh, some different groups are out there actually uh, with these portable speaker assemblies that they haul to your site with the tractor trailer truck. And uh, they've gotten to where they can reach some pretty decent levels with with that type of an excitation up until the middle 150 dB range. That, that was um, actually part of what sparked my question. An old college uh, friend of mine actually works for one of those companies now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting technique. Uh, I think they've actually worked together with some of the multi-axis control system vendors to try to optimize uh, you know the spectral characteristics of the noise signal. It's a it's a great technology, but it's it's going to be limited in uh, in, in decibel range. Uh, I'd say middle 150s. You might want to do a little bit more checking on that, but that was the the levels I was aware of last. Um, I guess if any specific questions, I'm those are the three techniques. Uh, at Redstone, we do two of those techniques. We don't we do not have the option to travel with speakers. Uh, I'm drawing a name blank on the company now. Vesta, I see you're on. You may remember off the top of your head. Um, but 
and as far as how NASA does it differently than mill standard, uh, I'm not sure exactly how much different one can do other than the, those three techniques. Yeah, that's that's really good information. Uh, yeah, I've not heard of the uh, the portable uh, acoustic chambers on, so that's kind of cool. Uh, <laughs> I think it's I need not. To it's not. Investigate that. <laughs> it's, it's actually not even a portable chamber. They they're usually done outside or in a very large high bay area, and you can imagine with these payloads that we deal with that have uh, high length to diameter ratios that uh, you stack them up, and uh, and then you can excite the structure that way. You don't even have to have a chamber. You know, and that's that's a really interesting thought. You know, when you think about the, the stuff that we deal with, it's very large and. Uh, most of our induced vibration would if it might be aero, aero acoustic instead of uh, strictly mechanical or something like that. So uh, that would be something that we definitely want to take a thought on and see if that's, uh, you know, kind of pull on that string a little bit. And if you can remember what that the name of that is eventually, you know, if you can dump it in the chat chat window. Yeah, that uh, yeah, well, it, you can find it. It's in five, six, uh, not 516. It's uh... What is it? Five fifteen, I think. Fifteen, yeah, yep. Fourteen, fifteen, yeah. sixteen is, is the is the only way I remember them. Okay. Is uh, anybody doing combined testing, combining a vibration and acoustics environment at the same time? Yeah, yeah, you can do that. We we have actually uh, in in our particular facility, we have a a team uh, cube of six off shaker in the middle of our acoustics chamber, and I know the guys that. Uh, Sandia Labs for many years, they had a couple of shakers inside one of their large chambers. So that's a common practice. Okay. Cool. And and Mike, what's the benefit of doing that? I mean, I know the benefit, but if you can kind of, yeah. you're, well, you're more, the, more versed in explaining it than I am. Yeah, in the, the, in the acoustics world, you know, the, the spectral, it's hard to get low frequency energy into a structure. So a lot of times, uh, if you've got a captive carry scenario, maybe getting the low frequency energy into a structure through the mechanical path, you know, up through maybe 100 hertz or 200 hertz, something like that. And then the, in addition to that, you might have acoustic energy that's, you know, 50 hertz to 8 kilohertz, for example. So there's going to be some crossover of spectral uh, forcing function, but uh, that would be the, the main reason we would do it. Yeah, sounds great. All right, Douglas, did that help your your first question on the acoustics? Yeah, I was just curious what uh, industry was doing on the military side. It's neat to know something that's going. On. Okay, perfect. Um, and then you, I've already forgotten your second question. I'm sorry. Go ahead and ask it again. That's it. Kind of all over the place. It. Um, so we we do some level of testing against mill standard A10, and then. Uh, I've had clients say, well, statistically, how how certain are you? You know, what's what's your mean and standard deviation for how many road miles this thing can do? And um, so moving from here's my life cycle environmental plan, all my test results to something that is has some level of statistical validity. Um, I haven't dealt with a huge amount of that. I was wondering if anybody had a that transition on objects uh, starting with mill standard A10. Yeah, so yeah, that's an interesting question. So let's assume that you've got your life cycle environmental profile well defined. You know you're going to do, you know, so many miles on paved road, cross country, gravel road, things of that nature. When we go out and collect the field data, the first problem that you run across is say I'm on a helicopter, for example, or, or a, as I said, we said wheeled vehicle. We'll go with a wheeled vehicle, for example. I might have one or two vehicles I can go out and make measurements off of. So right off the bat, it's hard to get into a big statistical discussions with your sample size of one or two, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're, when you're collecting, when you're collecting data, we, you know, we generally do a few things. We'll, we'll take a look at the vehicle itself. Is it in good shape? Is it a new vehicle? Is it old, wore out, you know? just a general shape of the vehicle and talk to the driver and, you know, see what the driver's experiences are. And, and then, you know, then we'll actually try to do a spec development process and the spec development process. One default is actually in the back of method 514. There are other techniques that are out there, but it's going to basically involve uh, some level of conservatism. 
you know, you're dealing with your measurement size of one or two, you're, there's going to be some conservatism involved. Once you have a spec, however, uh, as far as developing statistical reliability, that's just going to depend entirely on how many test items you run through the, the process. You know, um, do you have a, this is another interesting thing in, in the kind of work we do, and even more so on the NASA side, where they may have sample sizes of one on actual test payloads. So they're going to be relying very heavily to a large degree on subsystem testing and on modeling and simulation activities. On the Army side, uh, maybe it's something simple like a mortar. Well, the guys up at Ken's place, they might run, you know, hundreds of mortars through a, through a test, and they may be able to develop some level of statistical, uh, you know, some statistical database of some sort, if you will. So, so it's a wide open question, like you said, and it very often depends on how many payload test items are involved or what the ability to actually collect field data in the first place is. Ken, uh, sorry, uh, Steve, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I often get clients asking me, well, how many hours of temper high temperature testing equates to how many years of life in the field and how do I figure that out? And what I tell them, rather than get anybody's hopes up, I just tell them, you can't do it. You know, th there is no way because what we're doing with mill standard 810 type testing is we are looking at what the extremes, the extremist, and I don't know if that's a word, the worst environment uh, that our equipment is going to see and make sure it can survive that. But if you want to know how long it's going to last at that environment, there's very little in mill standard 810 testing that'll cover that other than maybe some of the transportation things. Um, that combined with the fact is even though we do our absolute best as engineers to predict what the service environment is going to be, you actually can't tell. If it's a commercial product, you may have an automobile radio it's going to go into a luxury car driven on freeways. That same radio may go into a pickup truck of a Montana cattle rancher and never drive on paved roads. Um, the A-10 aircraft was designed from the ground up due to a political situation that told us that our next war was going to be fought in northern Europe with the Russian tanks coming across Poland. Where did the A-10 actually end up getting used? Someplace else entirely out in the desert. So to summarize all that stuff that I've been saying is, I don't think you can really get statistical information from mill standard A10 testing as far as product life goes. We start to get into reliability type testing, reliability development testing, or uh, HALT, uh, TAF, then we could have a discussion about it. But mill standard A10 testing, we're just trying to make sure that this darn thing is going to work in the environment that we think it's going to see. And it's typically the worst case environment. Um of you know kind of the bounding condition in temperature is the minus the lows to the highs uh, the humidities uh, hum, hum, uh, an inordinate amount of humidity that'll never occur on the face of the planet unless you're sitting in your sauna kind of thing um, but yeah those that is a really a, a really good um, a good thought there so so doug when you talk about uh wanting to think about you know product reliability eight times not the I wouldn't use it as the the go the go by to say if you know from a product reliability perspective for sure it'll get you can the design handle the the limitation the limits of the requirements but from a reliability perspective that's those are some different kind of things. Thank you all that's really helpful. It's always you know tough with clients who want to try and shrink schedules and accomplish multiple or get in essence multiple outputs from the same set of testing. Yep, agreed. And Harsha has a really great comment in the chat. He said he said to do reliability testing. I don't recall which standard covers it. It requires your knowing the failure mode with high confidence. So very true. And doing accelerated life tests on sub sub assemblies and a statistically I can't speak significant sample size to have high confidence levels. So Harsha, I think you're you're echoing exactly what uh, Steve and Mike are saying. For sure. All right. Um. So, Doug, anything else on that, your question? Because that's a, those are really great questions. That was really helpful. Um, and just to go back to the acoustic side, I looked it up and my uh, friend uh, works for Acoustic Research Systems um, and the other big company that does that stuff is uh, MSI, I think. So, yeah. Perfect. Names, Thank you. Are. Acoustic Research Systems, I'm just going to put that in the chat. And MSI, Mike Sierra Indigo. Yes. Okay. I don't good. Remember what it stands for, but we'll look it up. 
<laughs> yeah, I've only ever seen acoustics testing done in a NASA context, so it's interesting to hear that it's been used actively. Yep. All right. Good questions. Let's see. We're about 15 minutes before we end, and uh, as you guys remember, I got to step off right a couple minutes before the top of the hour. Uh, so we got about probably about another 10 more minutes so we can have discussion. Anyone else have questions that they want? Oh, Mr. Brown, for sure. Hello, uh, I had a question about transportation uh, vibration. So okay. some, some items uh, that you're testing, you can make an argument that it's going to be like back of the truck, uh, a jet, uh, helicopter, like a lot of different transportation methods. So for vibration, do you would you pick the harshest of those for transportation, or would you would you subject it to all? Oh, that's yeah, a really can, great I question. Can... Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> yeah. So so Austin, the when we talk about the harshest environments, you know, you have to be really careful because in the in the in the transportation environment, for example, a wheeled vehicle, a track vehicle, a rotor craft, and a fixed wing all yield drastically different spectral uh, vibration profiles. So one certainly wouldn't want to go in there and just envelope it because it'd be so hard that you would be, you know, unrealistically high. So, you know, it's going back to the life cycle and environmental profile. If you're going to do some over the road trucking, you know, thousand miles or whatever, by all means, do a common carrier test. If you're also going to transport on, say, a, you know, a, a Chinook, a CH-47 or something of that nature, then you should have some amount of hours on, on that particular environment and treat them separately. You know, more often than not, uh, especially in the transportation mode of something's in its packaged environment, you you get on a, sh a shaker, you're fixtured up and you do common carrier, then you just switch into, you know, uh, fixed wing or rotor wing or whatever's next. So it shouldn't be a real big deal to change from one vibration profile to the next. Yep, that's, that is, has exactly been my experience. And Steve, I, I see you acknowledging the, nod, the head nod north and south that, yep, that is, you know, it, it you know, our program managers, they're always interested in saving time and, you know, just getting it done and do, doing the least amount of possible. But if, if, but to, to Mike's point, you could, if you did that envelope, you could induce unrealistic failures. It's something that, that you would fail the device in a way because you're exciting all these multiple frequencies at multiple amplitudes that would never ever occur in the real world simultaneously. It uh, doesn't mean that that fatigue's not there. It just doesn't occur simultaneously. So when you have resonances and harmonics you're, and you excite them all together, they're not, the system doesn't behave that way. Uh, so in my experience, that, that's always bad news, but there, there comes a point when you, if you start to look at the physics of failure of your box, let's say your box is, a, you know, a small brick type of thing, you know, it's, it's got a really, really high fundamental frequency. It's got, it's really dense. It's not a lot of craziness going on inside of it. Uh, not a lot of moving parts, not a lot of electricals. You might be able to get away with a one size fits most. It just really depends on what you're trying to build. Um, for sure, I would not do it that to a full integrated system, but maybe at a black box level, I might take some of that into account or bucket the ones that are closer to each other you know, more like shaped spectrally together to get, you know, to maybe in, drop it down from 10 or 12 different tests to maybe two or three. Steve, you had your hand like that. Well, hey, uh, one, one more thing. I, I, whoops. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say is that when we're doing transportation testing on most items for mill standard 810, we are testing items that are in a designated shipping container. So then the question comes up, well, aren't we really testing the capability of the shipping container? And the answer is yes, we are. We're testing the shipping container really to make sure that it's going to protect whatever our item is in this environment. So we can set that aside for a moment and then look at the items that we test mill standard 810 that we don't put in shipping containers, but instead have what we refer to often as a shipping configuration. Things like aerospace ground uh, ground support equipment, right? These things that are built into a transit case. And before you move them, you wrap the uh, the cables up inside and they have little racks and we might lock out a hard disk drive and then put the cover on. And now the item is its own transit case. And now you have to start looking really closely at 
how is this thing going to be secured when it's transported? If it's in a helicopter, it's probably going to be strapped down. If it's in a pickup truck, now we're looking at loose cargo testing. So once again, it's all tailored. Yep. Yep. Go ahead, Mike. And just one more. Yeah, one more thing. This is a, an example, I guess, that would probably ring close to Julie's uh, past history. Is that for many years, one of our customers had a, a missile system that was carried around on a track vehicle. And then they decided to move it over to a wheeled vehicle. And the colonel at the time saw that the wheeled vehicle aren't GRMS levels were, you know, only about 60, 50 or 60 percent of that, that it were the, than what they were for the track vehicle. So he said, well, these levels are lower for wheeled vehicles. We don't even need the test. And, and then, you know, I tried to go through this discussion with him about your spectral changes. And now your velocities are much higher. Your velocities have probably quadrupled and could not could not get him to, to buy off on the fact that it was going to be a worse test. And finally, it's, sir, we're, we're testing over at the field test at the road course today. Would you like to come over and take a look? So we drove over to the field course and the first, first time he saw this wheeled vehicle go over some of these wheeled courses like six inch bumps and two inch washboard and watched his item get pounded even though the G levels were lower than track vehicle. All of a sudden it's like, yep, I got it. So, you know, every once in a while with the customer, if you have the luxury, you might just need to take them out and let them see something in action. <laughs> yeah, I had a very similar product to that. And I almost got fired when I tried to tell the colonel yeah. that hey, I get it, that the, that the levels are lower, but it's not about the specific overall RMS, you know, the area under the curve. It's about the specific, the specific fre frequency and spectral concept content for sure. All right. So it is all, um, it, it is all about yeah. tailoring. Yep. And that's exactly the front matter of 810 spends, you know, we can jump into the methods and everything like that. But I think that's the biggest part of 810 is that this is not to be, uh, you know, uh, a one size fits all tailoring is essential. You have to understand where your requirements come from. And hopefully if you're building black boxes, widgets and gadgets that the, 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 your, you know, your prime or your customer has done their real homework to give you a real live life cycle environmental profile that makes sense or at least gives you something that you can use to derive your own life cycle profile and if that's not happening that's a challenge and um, and for the iris folks you know you guys aren't building big systems yet so you are kind of in the at the um, uh, you know the the mercy of your of your customer to make sure that they've done that work but these are good questions that you can go ask them Hey, Julie, I've got a question slash comment yeah. if everybody's done. So Austin, did that answer your looking... question before we move on? Oh, yeah. Yes, that was very helpful. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Go ahead, Mike. Mike, did we lose you? I'm here then, but before there you, you ask, yeah. So, <laughs> you ahead. know, I, I think I think the thing was 66 pages. Ken could probably validate that. We're up to 1,089 pages now. So basically, Ken has a tremendously hard job of trying to maintain this document. I know he's got different subject matter experts that address various regions. I know I noticed Vesta's on, for example. She, she's our expert in the, uh, Dr. Bateman does the uh, tech, uh, pyrotechnic work, if you will. And she's involved in other areas as well. Um, Ken has other people that have subject matter experts in each one of these areas, but he's got a coordinate all of this and I know he's thinking about some options for the future look of 810. I wonder if he's ready to talk about any of that at this point. Oh, good question. Moving into the future of 810. Uh, well, I've been in discussions with the Defense Standardization Program Office and uh, DLA who manages um, the assist database and trying to come up with a um, approach for how to basically keep the document uh, relevant at all times. Um, the biggest problem you have with a document of its size, it's a, well over a thousand pages. And if you were just to update a single method, uh, you still at that point, uh, and go through the publishing process, you still at that point have to go back and uh, update the other methods. And it just, at a thousand and some odd pages, it just, can be a nightmare in the sense one little thing can cause it a problem across the whole document. You know, word processing and everything goes. Um, and even converting it to PDF sometimes doesn't work right. So with all that said, we're looking at 
potentially going to an approach that has uh, a cover sheet being uh, mainly part one and part three under the cover sheet of 810. And then each of the methods potentially standing on their own um, as a sub section to that cover letter. In other words, you'd have like mill standard 810H as the cover cover uh, cover sheet, and then mill standard uh, 810H-514, which would be a standalone document um, that we could potentially update uh, much much easier and in a more timely fashion. A lot well, that's of times, a really great a idea. Student, yeah, and a lot of times when you update a single method and you go off the coordination, you'll get comments on the other method. <laughs> yeah, you haven't even sure. you know haven't even attend, attempted to address. Yeah, I wasn't even thinking about that. And then, but yeah. if you do it that way, then you you can maybe get some different focals. You know, folks that are uh, contributors to that, yeah. focusing on the area that that they know instead of you know trying to treat the whole. So we're, we're we're open to um, to changing changing it up some. Um, I like that idea, Ken. I think that's great. Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I understand. Yeah. Well, it's gotten, you know, for a user, it makes it even more user friendly. But for, uh, in a sense of a practitioner, but right. for someone that's using it in contracts, uh, it could make it much, much more difficult. So we have to be conscious of that. Oh, I, I completely agree on that. You know, we struggle with that on our own side, uh, you know, is it is it 810G change notice, whatever, is it 810H, is it D, you know, that we, and sometimes we do default back to the past history, but I don't like doing that. But, you know, that's that's a really good thing that you know, we think about If that. it's just a product improvement or something like that, it's hard to hold them against uh, some of the stuff in the new newer standard, you know? Right, agreed. Because yeah. we don't want to have to go through the whole qualification reliability chain again you know because the standard upgraded itself or the because there's a very minor change to the product that you're talking about yeah good good discussion all right we'll see yeah I'm gonna have to leave julie um so you can feel free to um and thank you for so much for moderating um sure today. you guys have been great does anyone have, I know Julie, go ahead and log off. Does anyone have any last minute questions before we close out the session? Anything at all? And if you think of something, I mean, I think the session went, went really well today. Um, we should look at possibly doing this again on this same topic. I'm sure there's questions that come up continuously um, as people are doing things. Um, but I don't see anyone else. Any la last call for questions? I have one completely weird one. Uh, on humidity testing uh, in really, really small volumes, um, I've had issues separating the effect of like uh, transducer drift um, from what's actually happening, or I guess transducer off-gassing. Um, I was wondering if anybody had techniques when you're dealing with something uh, like an enclosure um, that's about a liter in volume and you're trying to monitor humidity over a long period of time. Uh, are you saying your sensor's getting saturated or what are you saying? Yeah, um, well, not, not that the sensor's getting saturated, but that even like a uh, high-end bisolid sensor in a glass jar um, I'm still seeing drift over time in the you know 10 to 20 percent range, relative humidity wow. range, where it's just gradually creeping up. Yeah, for the most part, we have um, our chamber uh, chambers are. I'm not going to say large, but they are larger. Um, the first thing I would think is: is there some sort of temperature compensation coming into play? Our 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 trying to find or work with the manufacturer and figure out where they're getting this drift from. Yeah, and, and these are um, like uh, by solid sensors that I'm putting in, in the interior of enclosures to look at yeah. humidity drift. Yeah, I mean, it could be it could be any number of things. I mean, 
Is it still there? Is it, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, we've, we've done uh, everything we can to eliminate all of that bake out, trying to put sensors on the, um, uh, in uh, enclosure materials we know have no humidity or moisture that can, uh, can off gas or permeate. So, just But you're still that. encountering something, in other words. Yep, I'm still seeing graphs that show a really slow kind of log curve. Okay. Um, the first point I would look is uh, seals that you're using to get the sensor in there. That would probably be the first spot I'd look at. Yeah, we've been digging into uh, RDP meters and a few other things to. Yeah. And even you can, you know, Vicella is nice to work with. You can always talk to them and, and explain what's going on and do they have something, uh, a better recommendation of what to use in an environment. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, um, Steve, Mike, and Ken for all the information that you gave today. And thank you, everyone who attended today's webinar. Um, please watch out on the IEST website for more training that is going to be coming up. We do have quite a few training. Um, courses as well. We will be holding more webinars like this as well. Um, so um, thank, every, thank you everyone for attending and everyone have a good rest of their day. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.